Why do video game movies always suck? It's a simple question that no one seems to be able to answer. Beginning with 1993's mind-boggling disaster piece Super Mario Bros., video game movies, especially live-action ones, have almost uniformly been what scientists describe as just astoundingly bad. And wait, does that mean their names are Mario Mario and Luigi Mario? It's Mario Mario and Luigi Mario. Now, sure, some of them are halfway decent and others are deeply guilty pleasures, but why is that the bar for success? Why aren't video games able to make the leap from plastic case to the silver screen like comic books have? Well, that's exactly what we're going to talk about on today's episode of The Dan Cave. Now, like it or not, video game movies are the next big thing. At least they are if you ask people that work in acquisitions for major Hollywood studios. Now, according to an article on Den of Geek, there's approximately 61 video game movies currently in development. Let that sink in for a second. This includes a Call of Duty cinematic universe, Five Nights at Freddy's, Fruit Ninja, The Last of Us, a Tomb Raider reboot, and a trilogy of films about Tetris. How the hell you can make one film about Tetris, let alone three, is a question that'll haunt me to my dying day. And if I live long enough to see two Tetris films get made, that day may come well before the finale of said trilogy. Now, despite the repeated failure of many video game films, both critically and at the box office, Hollywood remains hell-bent on finding that next big thing or making games that next big thing. For example, look at film history. Everyone, for example, used to make westerns until they went out of fashion in the late 70s and early 80s. Then Star Wars and Alien came out, and everyone and their mother was making sci-fi films. And then the 90s happened, and we got more Steven Seagal than any of us knew what to do with. What do we do with that ponytail and those kimonos? Nobody knows. Now we have comic book movies as far as the eye can see. How many comic book movies do we have? We have so many that we've drained the world's supply of handsome white dudes named Chris to slake our impossible thirst for more. Now my point is that once Hollywood sees something being successful, it wants to milk it for all that it's worth. And the next udder they've got their eyes on belongs to video games. Except that this cow to date has not yielded a film that scored above 50% on Rotten Tomatoes. And as for Metacritic, the highest score there belongs to 1995's Mortal Kombat, a DVD that I, an 11 year old at the time, convinced my family to buy. And while I love that movie dearly, I, like many 11 year olds, was dumb as hell. Hello baby, did you miss me? But these films do make money on occasion, and because Hollywood at its core is a risk-averse industry, it will always follow the money, desperately clinging to the popular and well-known intellectual properties like a remora clinging to the bottom of a shark. Now, if you try to think like a studio executive, this gamble does make sense. On paper, a Metal Gear Solid movie, or a The Last of Us movie, or a Mass Effect movie sounds like a great idea. They are all incredibly addictive video games that sold millions of copies, have a massive international fan base, and are renowned for their superior storytelling. Or in the case of Metal Gear, it's more of us trying to figure out what the hell's going on in Hideo Kojima's brilliant mind. The dude is bonkers. But these are all ingredients that would make for a potentially successful and profitable movie franchise. However, the problem in turning these games into movies is that Hollywood has a fundamental misunderstanding of why games are fun. Like movies, they offer an escape from the humdrum reality of workaday life. They immerse the player in far off fantasy realms, new galaxies, and a nine to five jobs where they try to raise a family before eventually killing them off in rooms full of bookcases and fireplaces and no doors. And actually, maybe that's just how I played The Sims, but I think you get what I'm trying to say here. They let us travel down sewer pipes to rescue princesses, scale snow capped mountains to fight gargantuan dragons, and even even throw pornographic magazines to distract genetically modified super soldiers. Video games let us do the impossible by putting us in the driver's seat. The key word in all of this is us. We are the player, we are in control. There's a certain sense of agency involved in playing video games that does not translate to the intrinsically passive experience of sitting and watching a film. Now, for example, the Angelina Jolie starring Tomb Raider movies were fun, action-packed larks, but they felt hollow, capturing neither the Indiana Jones-like joy of the games or the charisma of the character. You weren't the one raiding the tombs. You were the one paying an exorbitant amount for popcorn to watch someone else do it. And yeah, that someone else was Angelina Jolie, but was it as much fun as the games? I don't think so. Likewise, the Assassin's Creed movie seemed like it really understood the appeal of the source material, but as it turns out, Watching Michael Fassbender fumble his way around a sterile Abstergo facility is even less enjoyable than playing those bullshit levels in the game itself. Newsflash, the best part of Assassin's Creed is exploring the past in living, breathing color and using cool parkour to pull off moves that you could never pull off in real life. It's not Jeremy Irons sneering his way to a paycheck. It's not my best work, but it gets the point across. 
Back in 2005, the late great film critic Roger Ebert sent gamers into a tizzy when he declared that video games are not art. He wrote that, quote, video games by their nature require player choices, which is the opposite of the strategy of serious film and literature, which requires authorial control, end quote. Now, while I don't agree with his sentiments regarding video games' capacity to become works of art, he is correct in that films need directors in order to work. Without a director steering the ship, it will inevitably scuttle itself on the rocky shores of creativity and logistics. In 2010, Ebert doubled down on this idea, declaring that, quote, no one in or out of the field has ever been able to cite a game worthy of comparison with the great poets, filmmakers, novelists, and poets, end quote. And yes, he said poets twice for some reason. Now, this statement might rankle some of you out there, but he's not saying it to invalidate the medium of video games. He's saying that to highlight a problem with trying to force video games into a medium where they're ill-suited. The biggest problem with many video game movies can actually be summarized by another thing that Roger Ebert wrote, his delightfully vicious one-star review of 2005's Doom. The late great critic wrote that the movie has been inspired by the famous video game. No, I haven't played it, and I never will, but I know how it feels to not play it because I've seen the movie. Doom is like some kid came over and is using your computer and won't let you play. Wow. While Doom is decidedly not a good movie, Ebert's point can be applied to video game movies as a whole, because as they stand now, they feel kind of like you're stuck watching some other kid play through all the good parts, forcing you to just watch the cutscenes. It's kind of like you're Rod and Todd Flanders, while Bart tells you, don't worry, you're on a team with me. Yeah! Now, some might point to the rise of things like Twitch and YouTube Let's Plays as evidence that audiences don't mind watching others play games, but that's something of a false equivalency because in these instances, audiences care less about what's actually being played than who is playing it. They're watching these videos to create the virtual equivalent of hanging out with a friend in the living room, playing games, and commiserating about what's happening with other friends in real time. And speaking of personality-driven content, Many video games are themselves anchored by strong, charismatic protagonists that keep players coming back year after year to continue their adventures. Uncharted has the puckish rogue that's Nathan Drake, The Last of Us has the post-apocalyptic father-daughter dynamic of Joel and Ellie, and Mass Effect has Commander Shepard, whose sole mission is to smooch everyone in the galaxy or die trying. At least that's how I roleplayed Shepard. What about you? These characters are the end result of teams of writers and designers laboring for months and months to create characters that would not only feel fun to watch, but also who you'd want to control and whose destinies you'd want to shape. Cutscenes work in video games because they feel like the end result of your actions. What happens when you divorce these cutscenes from the feeling of control and just leave players with a narrative that you've been made to watch? Well, you get Metal Gear Solid. hey -oh! Just kidding, I really love those games, and they have kick-ass gameplay to back up their feature like Lolly Lulelo nonsense. I need scissors. 61. You need that. If you don't have compelling gameplay along with the story, all you have is a non-interactive movie where none of the stakes feel like they have any weight. On the flip side, many video games don't even have these outsized personalities to wrap themselves around. Some of the greatest games of all time, ones that are renowned for their storytelling, star largely silent protagonists as a means of helping players project themselves into the role of the main character. Games like Half-Life, Portal, The Legend of Zelda. Remember the Legend of Zelda animated series? Yeah, there's a reason that Link never opens his mouth other than to say, hop. Well, excuse me, princess. Now, this isn't to say that video game movies can't work, but perhaps the problem lies within the medium of film itself. I mean, look at the average length of a game. Even some of these shorter AAA releases clock in at a respectable 10 to 20 hours of gameplay. Because at $60 a pop, you wanna feel like you're getting your money's worth from a brand new video game. And that is already the length of five to 10 feature films or 2.5 Transformers films. Maybe video games simply shouldn't be movies, period. Maybe based on decades of empirical evidence and these scores of unwanted DVDs filling up gas station bargain bins, maybe video games are better suited for the medium of television, where you can give these sprawling narratives room to breathe and meaningfully expand on the lore put forth by the original, rather than just giving us a microwaved rehash of what we've already played. A Mass Effect TV series, for example, could do for modern sci-fi what Battlestar Galactica did in the mid-2000s. The Last of Us, by putting it on television, you could really encapsulate the relationship building between Joel and Ellie and get the drama that the designers wanted players to have over the course of dozens of hours. That sounds so much better. After all, we're supposedly living in the golden age of television, so why not capitalize on that by turning these mega-popular franchises into the next Game of Thrones? But maybe I'm wrong. 
Maybe now with a decade of Marvel movies showing the right way to build a cinematic universe based on long-standing IP with legions of dedicated fans, a video game franchise could transcend the genre and do the same thing. Maybe all it takes is three Tetris movies to prove once and for all that yes, mom, video games are art and that video game movies should be winning Oscars. Or maybe not. One way or another, we're gonna find out and we're gonna find out whether or not certain achievements were actually meant to be unlocked. But what do you think? Are video game movies doomed to fail? What do they need to do to succeed? What would actually make a good video game movie and why? Let me know in the comments below and press thumbs up to continue while you're there. Now be sure to like and subscribe or else you might miss next week's show about the story of a weapons dealing Nicolas Cage who gets caught up in an interdimensional conflict between orcs, humans, and whatever Paula Patton was supposed to be in the Lord of Warcraft. Until next time, keep on digging. Let's open up the old mailbag, shall we? At Cam Hollage asks, what would you rather have, a T-Rex sized duck or a duck sized T-Rex? Well, that's a great question. It's something I've often thought about and after seeing a metric ton of ducks when I was in Boston recently, I'm gonna have to go with a duck sized T-Rex because tiny carnivores honestly seem much more manageable than a duck would that I need to keep in a special paddock and would just terrify neighbors with its corkscrew shaped downstairs mix up. So yeah, definitely a wee Rex, but tell me, what would you rather have? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you guys next time.